International Media TV. Television that listens to you. Hi, I'm Johnny Burrell. Welcome to the program. I'm here with Alex Johnson, Executive Director of the Children's Defense Fund, California. Yes. Thanks for this opportunity, Alex. Thank you. First of all, tell us about the uh, Defense Fund, what it's about, what the mission is. So the Children's Defense Fund is an organization founded in 1973 by Marion Wright Edelman in Washington, D.C. Uh, the Children's Defense Fund California is an organization uh, that was started as the largest state office of the Children's Defense Fund. So uh, there are seven state offices across the country. Uh, California has the largest. There are state offices in New York, and Texas, and Minnesota, Ohio, and other uh, states. Uh, we began in 1998 actually in the city of Oakland and we've expanded uh, since then to Los Angeles, to Long Beach and to Sacramento. And our work is uh, multifold. We work on education, on child poverty, on juvenile justice and on children's health and we do some programmatic work uh, as well. Uh, we're fighting uh, to make sure that the odds for all children are improved across this state. Uh, and so that's why we've expanded our work uh, to include places like Long Beach and obviously the work in Sacramento because it's important that we reach and touch all children. Marianne Wright Edelman. Yeah. Tell us who she is and uh, most of us know and if yeah. we don't, tell us who she is. I mean if you, if you don't know you better ask somebody. She is uh, someone who is a civil rights leader, who is uh, probably the premier child advocate, was talking about children before anyone else did. The first black woman to pass the Mississippi Bar, uh, be admitted to the Mississippi Bar rather, uh, and the first uh, woman, the first leader to put children on uh, the front line uh, and to raise the issues of child poverty and of educational neglect and of inequity of children. Uh, she's an advocate, uh, she is fiery, she is passionate, uh, she's my boss, uh, but beyond she's that... she's been one of my sheroes for a very, very long time. She is uh, many uh, of uh, our uh, uh, contemporaries, she's our shero. She's uh, someone who I think we turn to not just for inspiration, but for leadership and motivation to continue the fight uh, forward because uh, we've moved incrementally over the years, we've made progress, but there's so much more uh, to be done and she is helping to lead uh, that fight. Child poverty here in the United States, give us the numbers. Yeah, so there are 14.7 million children uh, across the state, across the country rather, uh, who are in poverty, about two million children in California uh, are in poverty. Wow. Uh, a majority of those are children of color, uh, who are children who are in uh, Indian Reservation, Native American children. Um, they are in our cities. They are hiding in the shadows uh, across this state and across uh, this country. Uh, when we talk about child poverty, uh, we, when we talk about poverty rather, we often forget to talk about children. Uh, and the issue of children is great, obviously. Uh, we've got to solve the problems with, with their parents, with the adults, but we've also got to make sure that we are not creating generational cycles of poverty, and that ends if we address and if we attempt to uh, ensure that child poverty comes to an end once and for all. How do we get to this? Yeah. Children in the shadows. Yeah. Uh, how do we get to this point where the most uh, uh, influential and the wealthiest country in the world, yeah. uh, we have these children who are suffering? Yeah. Well, California is almost a nation state. It's, if you looked at the California economy, uh, trillion dollar uh, economy, uh, one of the ninth largest uh, economies in the world, uh, you will see that we are simply not doing enough. And so uh, earlier this year, the Children's Defense Fund California uh, decided that we would uh, release a report. And that report uh, outlined eight recommendations that we can do right now to end child poverty. Uh, one of those uh, recommendations is to make sure that we're raising the minimum wage, that we're making certain that parents of children 
have the capacity, have the economic uh, ability to put food on the table, to put a roof over their children's head, to a child's head, uh, to make sure that they have clothes on the back. And so we know that if a child is impoverished, a child's not going to do well in school. If a child's impoverished, uh, they are more likely to be susceptible to uh, the violence that takes place in our streets. Not just violence, physical violence, but the mental violence, sure. the trauma the that takes violence. place. Yes. Uh, we talk, uh, we're going to talk about education, health, uh, prison, uh, the prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. But in terms of what you uh, just said about hunger, uh, I was, uh, I'm from St. Louis and I remember yeah. teachers coming, some teachers brought food to, uh, to school to feed some of the children yeah. who were hungry. And uh, so I'm familiar with that, but certainly not to the degree that you are in the yeah. work that you're doing. Tell me, uh, Alex, how did you... Uh, uh, come to this arena of passion and being an advocate for children. What prompted or what happened in your lifetime that you said, I mean, there are a lot of things you, you can do. You're an yeah. attorney, yeah. you have a, a, a background that is impeccable. Uh, Tell us about you. I mean, uh, frankly, uh, I'd say a lifetime of advocacy started uh, in the church. Uh, and uh, that was a combination of my parents and the village that surrounded me. I grew up in Second Baptist Church in Los Angeles uh, under the tutelage and the leadership of a man named Dr. Thomas Kilgore, Jr., uh, who was a aide, a top aide to Martin Luther King, uh, who was uh, a pastor for uh, decades at Second Baptist uh, and who uh, was committed to civic engagement and leadership, was a top aide to uh, Mayor Bradley. And, and uh, I grew up in Second because of uh, my parents, uh, Betty and Jesse Johnson, my dad, uh, my late dad. My sister's name is Bessie. Well, uh, uh -huh. Betty, Betty. Oh, Betty, okay. Betty, Betty. Uh, my mom was a school teacher, my dad was a truck driver and a shop steward in uh, the Teamsters Union, mm -hmm. Local 848. Uh, and so uh, they were fighting the fight uh, long before it was uh, common practice for people to raise up and, and use their voices uh, to advocate, whether it was making sure that the, the neighborhood was uh, clean and had uh, what it needed, uh, making sure that my sister uh, and I had the tools we needed in school. And so a lifetime of advocacy really started at home and started uh, in the church and making certain that uh, I pay it for it is uh, how I go about life. Uh, the the uh, fund is about giving children a fair start and a, a safe start. Yes. But it's also about giving children a moral start. Yeah. Uh, talk to us about that. Uh, well, I mean, so we don't believe that children come in pieces, right? And so the Children's Defense Fund model, fair start, a healthy start, a safe start, a moral start, uh, and place them on a pathway to adulthood. And so uh, there are many things that the organization does uh, on policy, on programmatic work. Uh, but one thing that we do every single year is a children's Sabbath uh, and making certain that we bring our faith leaders uh, into the fold, uh, making certain that our faith leaders, our churches, our places of worship, uh, that they have an understanding of their role, of the stake uh, that they have and making sure the children uh, are given that fair start, that healthy start, that head start. Uh, last summer we, uh, we held and we convened uh, across this state and in uh, Seattle 33 Freedom Schools, which is a summer literacy wow. program that we do. And the Freedom Schools uh, program, they're often uh, housed with places of worship, uh, community-based organizations, but it's essentially making sure that we provide students the self-esteem, provide them with the tools they need to learn, but it's also giving them the literacy skills that they need that tend to drop off in the summer for children of color who don't have access oftentimes mm -hmm. to summer programs and to learning opportunities, academic enrichment. You go where they are. We go where they are. We meet them where they are. Parent engagement uh, and the like. And so the moral start piece uh, is really our extension of our founders' belief that uh, morality, that faith, uh, that spirituality uh, ought to play a role in the lives. It's not proselytizing, uh, it's just simply uh, making certain that we impress the values uh, that children ought to be front and center in our lives. We impress those values that children uh, are gifts, uh, that they have worth, 
uh, we impress those values on them and we seek to push those values out to those uh, who may need a reminder or who those who just need uh, to have a little more inspiration that uh, the fight is not yet won and that we have much more to do. And some of the things the fund does to help children to be or become healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, even with adults, uh, health care is a problem. Yeah. Uh, if, if some uh, people, middle class even, are, are who have the uh, money to be able to uh, get health insurance are still not insured as they should be. How do you help children, children to uh, become healthy or to be healthy? Uh, that's got to be a... It, it, it's a huge issue and, and really the Children's Defense Fund started uh, in California with working to make sure that 100% of children were enrolled in health care. We saw that tremendous numbers of children just simply were not enrolled in health care, didn't have access. And so if you don't intercept and, and, and intervene, rather, uh, in a child's life early with their health care, you have progressively worse instances of children uh, facing all sorts of health maladies. Were their parents insured? Uh, oftentimes parents weren't insured and so that's why we were strong supporters of Cover California and, and the, the uh, Affordable Care Act, making certain uh, that the Affordable Care Act got passed. But we're exceptionally proud of the fact that uh, we were part of a coalition that moved forward uh, work around health for all. This was a bill uh, by Senator uh, Ricardo Lara and others uh, with major support from the California Endowment and health coalitions. Uh, but we were front and center uh, making certain that Health for All, which uh, ensures that undocumented children have access to health care, that that passed. Uh, but also making sure that the reauthorization of the Children's Health Insurance Program, a federal health program, uh, that that was reauthorized in a Congress uh, that has been dominated uh, over the past few years by folks who simply uh, haven't wanted to do much uh, for children and we've got to continue that fight uh, in the Congress of the United States uh, going forward. Uh, hopefully we have that opportunity uh, in the presidential election if we elect uh, the right leadership. Well if you're around you will, you get the opportunity. Well, we, we hope so, we hope so. <laughs> uh, the justice system, the prison yeah. to pipeline, yeah. uh, talk to us about that system, yeah. how you help young people to not become a part of that system and sometimes even the, we know yeah. even the help that you give they end up uh, in that uh, line to prison. Yeah. Uh, talk to us about that that pipeline to the, the criminal detention and all of that. The prison the prison pipeline system is, is real and I think a, a lot of uh, folks uh, don't really know what it is. So here's what it is. It starts uh, oftentimes at a child's birth uh, it starts when a child is born into poverty. A child is not given the tools that they need, and that's not the parent's fault oftentimes. That's the system's fault. And so we're trying to break down systems and dismantle uh, structures that are often uh, inequitable uh, for children of color and children uh, who are poor. Uh, but the pipeline is essentially uh, the pathway from which a child goes, is born into poverty, goes into an educational system that is inadequate, uh, goes into a healthcare system that is inadequate, does not receive uh, the mental health services that they need to work uh, uh, against and fight issues of childhood trauma. Uh, they are kicked out of school as a result of a, a system that uh, pushes children of color, particularly African-American and Latino boys, out of school uh, through suspensions and expulsions and exclusionary practices uh, that place more cops in schools and counselors. Uh, and then they wind up in our juvenile justice system in L.A. County. We have one of the largest juvenile justice systems in the nation. 25% uh, are African Americans, 60 plus percent are Latino. African Americans only represent 9% uh. of that county. Uh, and then they go into the juvenile justice system and they oftentimes have not been given the resources and the tools they need uh, to succeed. It's more about punitive approaches than uh, educational and placing them on a pathway to career, placing them on a pathway to college, to getting the credits that they need to basically compete in the workforce uh, or to be productive citizens. They come out not having the skills that they need, not having the tools that they need, uh, and then they go right back in, not to the juvenile justice system always, but to the adult prison system. Uh, and oftentimes, they're winding up dead. And so uh, it's a very real phenomenon. It's something that we uh, don't uh, as a society talk about as much. We're talking about it more with the passage of Prop 47 and the criminal justice reform wave that is taking place across this nation and across uh, this state. But more needs to be done. 
I'll tell you this one point. Uh, I believe that in order to interrupt the uh, Pareto to Prison pipeline, we have to start by investing in early childhood education. Uh, every single uh, report, every single piece of research that you see around early childhood education shows that if you invest in kids early, if you invest in them often, uh, you won't have to invest in them on the back end. The back end being the juvenile justice system, the adult prison system. If we simply get with them and start early and make sure that they have the tools and the foundation they need uh, to succeed in life, uh, we will save money, we will save time, uh, we will save lives on the back end. And so uh, that's how we break down uh, the cradle of the prison pipeline. Uh, that's how we save generations of young black males and young black mm -hmm. girls and young Latino girls yes. and young Latino males. That's how we save them. That's how we start to save them. It's not a panacea, early childhood education, uh, but it is a start and it is the right start that we ought to be guaranteeing every single child. And uh, early childhood education doesn't just start at preschool, it starts at birth. <laughs> and we ought to get that uh, in our minds, making sure that parents have the tools that they need uh, to raise their children. Uh, I was blessed. I had mom and dad who was the firstborn. Uh, they uh, did not have everything, but we had roof over the head, food on the table, so I was blessed. But every single child does not have them. That's what we ought to make certain that children have uh, the basic necessities that they need so that they have a head start mm -hmm. uh, in life. Absolutely. Probation camps with regard yeah. to the pipeline. Yeah. Uh, pipeline. Talk to us about that. I, I, I saw when I had to do my homework yeah. in terms of the interview. <laughs> uh, I, I, w I was impressed because yeah. I, as a young boy, uh, I got into a little trouble. Yeah. And, uh, um, went back the second time and one of the counselors said of all the 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 kids Johnny wouldn't think you would come back but yeah. the second time for me, for me was different the teacher when we had to go to school every day talked to us and we we, we couldn't wait to go to class yeah. and so you alluded to that learning you know we had somebody who he taught us about pimples and he told us about yeah. cars and girls uh, and so it struck me so talk to us about how that probation camp yeah. works uh, so, uh, probation camp, obviously, uh, you know, after a young person uh, may be arrested, they may go through the system, the court system, they may be sentenced to juvenile probation camp. Uh, and so, our work is the following. We believe that, first of all, young people uh, should not be uh, in camps except uh, at the most egregious of circumstances. Um, and even then, uh, there may be better approaches than to just simply lock someone up. But for those young people who are in our uh, probation camps across the state or in our Department of Juvenile Justice uh, facilities, a couple things that, that people need to be reminded of. Uh, number one, uh, these are not disposable youth. We can't simply lock them up and throw away the key. We have to invest in them. They've made mistakes and we uh, ought to be a nation, a people, a state that believe in redemption. Uh, we believe in making certain that young people uh, can succeed in spite of uh, the youthful mistakes that they've made. That's number one. Number two, we've got to end solitary confinement in our uh, juvenile justice facilities. We've got to make sure uh, that young people uh, do not uh, get locked up for 22, 23 hours a day without access to uh, education, without access to counseling services, without time to be uh, in uh, the recreation yard and to enjoy. You can't simply lock kids up and throw away the key. And so Senator Mark Leno uh, yesterday introduced a bill uh, for the fifth year. Uh, this bill has been introduced, but it's been renamed, and it's called the Stop Torture of Children Act. Uh, and along with Ella Baker Center and Youth Justice Coalition and the California Public Defenders uh, Association, Children's Defense Fund California is a co-sponsor of this important bill uh, once again. And we will end the solitary confinement of young people uh, in this state once and for all. And then finally, we've got to make certain that their educational uh, facilities that their uh, educational mm -hmm. programs mm -hmm. rather are up to speed. Uh, I serve on the board of LA County Board of Education. 
but beyond that, Children's Defense Fund uh, works across the state in seven probation camps through our Freedom Schools program, uh, where we've taken a model that we've applied in traditional settings and placed it in this detention setting, working with our probation officers, working with our educators, working with our mental health uh, counselors and others. Uh, to make certain that children not only have the literacy skills while they're in camp, that they're gaining college credits, uh, that they are learning to work together, uh, that they are learning that they can do whatever they aspire to, uh, as long as it's positive and as long uh, as it's serving uh, to better not only themselves but their communities. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we've done it in Alameda County with the work of the Lincoln Child Center. Uh, we've done it in LA County with the work of uh, my former boss, Supervisor Mark Ridley Thomas in the County of Los Angeles, our partners at the LA County Office of Education, the Department of Probation, and we've seen tremendous results. We've seen racialized violence go down. We've seen uh, classroom restructures uh, go down significantly. We've seen literacy rates go up significantly. But most importantly, uh, we've seen the culture of these camps change and shift. Uh, and it's a credit to our chief probation officers, uh, particularly in Alameda County, our uh, probation uh, officers, our detention services officers, our teachers who are in their camps who make this work, and our partners uh, who we work with, uh, who invested in our superintendent of schools in LA County, uh, Dr. Arturo Delgado and his staff, is moving this forward, making certain that this is integrated into the overall uh, academic program. And we ought to salute them for taking a chance and taking uh, a risk uh, to do something. Uh, but once they did it, they saw that it improves lives and it's changing these young people's lives. And then finally, uh, there's a story uh, that is uh, becoming more commonplace through the work of this program where we're seeing our probation officers who oftentimes have seen uh, their jobs, uh, safety and security and some of the mentoring aspect, but who have expanded how they view how they can be a part of this role, not just staying in their silo, but expanding and broadening their view. Uh, there's a probation officer who, a couple of probation officers who as a result of this program, as a result of their involvement working with young people, were inspired to get their substitute teacher's licenses wow. uh, and work uh, across the span with young people. And it's important that we support our uh, probation officers and our teachers who are doing this type of work, yes. that we give them support and the tools, the mental health counselors, the uh, mental health workers and others, because uh, they are very necessary. And these young people cannot be considered disposable youth. They cannot be considered a throwaway youth. They're a foster youth. They're homeless youth. They're youth who have simply gone in the wrong direction. It's their job to place them back on track. We ought to celebrate it. What is the one thing the fund does to uh, try at least to get people to see that it is in our interest to invest in children? What is the one thing that you have found to be um, that works, that gets people's attention? Uh, of the many things we do, I'd say the one thing that is uh, most important is changing the narrative around how we view children. Mm. Uh, and it's that children don't come in pieces. Mm. Uh, and I use this sort of simple, simplistic nursery rhyme that uh, my mom uh, used when I was a, a young person. It and, worked and on you. <laughs> that it worked on me and, and it's, it's stuck. Uh, but it's about the skeletal frame and it's the knee bones connected to the leg bone, the leg bones connected yes. to the foot bone, the foot bones connected to the toe bone. Well the same thing applies to how we ought to view children. Uh, mental health is connected to their educational uh, achievements and academic performance. Uh, early childhood education is connected to whether or not we can disrupt them from going into the, uh, the prison system, the juvenile justice system. Uh, health care is connected to whether a child performs in the classroom, whether a child uh, is able to uh, improve uh, uh, their ability uh, to see, to be able to go out and play, to be active, uh, and uh, ensuring that a child uh, has food on the table and a roof over their head, uh, has a cyclical 
uh, effect, a generational impact on children. And so we ought to be thinking about children from a whole child uh, perspective, uh, thinking that children don't come in pieces, that ought to apply to policymakers, that it should apply uh, to folks who uh, philanthropically support uh, the work of children. Uh, it apply to all of us as we go about thinking, how can uh, you or I uh, how can we improve the quality of life for children? I'll say that uh, it takes uh, ordinary people uh, who can do extraordinary things to improve uh, the odds for young people. So it's the whole child, changing the frame, changing the narrative that I think has uh, broadly been uh, some of the most important piece of work that we've done through our various avenues of our policy and our programmatic work. I want, and I'm sure a lot of people want to know more about you, uh, can you think of a story with regard to um, a child or a family and mm -hmm. children that, that you worked with that came out uh, whole mm -hmm. and uh, well, so, it's, so something that you, that you were involved in? And yeah. Uh, so, a uh, number of young people that I think we've been able to impact, uh, particularly in California, thousands uh, through the work that we've done on policy, uh, through our programmatic uh, work. Uh, and there's not uh, one specific person, it's a mishmash of a number of, mm -hmm. of stories that, that come to mind, uh, whether it's a young, undocumented, a uh, child who, as a result of our work around Health for All, mm -hmm. uh, was able to get health care. Uh, whether it's uh, the young people who, as a result of the work we've done on juvenile justice uh, reform, uh, who are now on a pathway back uh, to school, who are succeeding in school. Uh, whether it's the young people who, through our Beat the Odds scholarship program, who we've uh, invested in since their sophomore year of high school, uh, who are now succeeding at the highest levels, attending uh, top colleges, getting top grades uh, in all sorts of careers. And we uh, celebrate those young people. And so uh, I can't condense it down to just one person because there are stories uh, of so many young people uh, who I interact with, uh, who my staff interacts with, uh, but whose lives we have touched uh, for the good. And not just them, but their parents. And in touching young people, their parents, uh, we've sought and we've begun to change community. Mm -hmm. And we've begun to change the way that people I think about uh, children. Uh, and so uh, I'm just simply blessed to be a part of it, to be a part of uh, a legacy that uh, began in 1973, before 1973. Uh, with Mrs. Edelman uh, and the Children's Defense Fund and proud to carry it on uh, in California and uh, make sure that we improve the lives of these children here up and down the state from uh, Northern California to Southern California to the Central Valley and places uh, beyond. There are thousands upon thousands uh, of children who are suffering, millions of children uh, who are suffering and we ought to uh, make certain that we do everything in our power uh, to help them. Your work uh, with uh, Johnny Cochran, the late mm. Johnny Cochran, yeah. uh, what kind of an influence yeah. uh, did he have? Uh, he was an advocate. Yeah. I, I met Johnny Cochran uh, early, young in life. Grew up again at Second Baptist Church. He was a member of Second Baptist Church. His, his family, his brother, his sister, his dad, uh, who we call the chief is a member and he's 90 something years old and still uh, at second. Um, I interviewed Johnny Cochran in third grade for a book report uh, and sat down with him and, and I knew I wanted to become a lawyer uh, after that. Uh, and then I had the privilege to work for him while I was in law school. Um, uh, I was at American University in DC and came back uh, to California, uh, uh, worked for him, clerked for him, uh, and right before his passing. And I learned a lot from him and others at the firm, Brian Dunn, uh, but learned a lot about uh, pursuing justice at all costs. Um, and I think as an attorney, uh, 
uh, I don't practice anymore, but as someone who's trained in law, who practiced in law, uh, who's worked at the Public Defender Service in D.C. and worked with indigent defendants, uh, indigent uh, individuals to, to get a proper defense, it's pursuing justice at all costs. And that translates to now. Um, uh, I think that uh, Johnny Cochran's legacy lives on in the uh, hundreds upon thousands of young lawyers and older lawyers who were inspired by his work. He started as a district attorney, uh, deputy district attorney in Los Angeles. I started my career the same way as an assistant DA in the Bronx, New York. Uh, and then he went uh, to have some high profile cases, but he had some cases that started with ordinary people whose names uh, people did not know until he touched that case and simply uh, sought to right wrongs of police abuse and neglect that continue to persist today. Uh, and when we look at Black Lives Matter and we look at uh, some of the issues uh, that are taking place across our country uh, from a legal perspective and from an advocacy perspective, he knew how uh, to work that program and to make certain that justice uh, was obtained, not just pursued, but obtained by people. And it set in place reforms, it set in place uh, accountability put into place a spotlight on issues that have persisted in communities of color uh, for decades. And uh, I think we are seeing um, uh, in recent years a lot of that uh, come back around, never left, but come back around in the spotlight uh, through Black Lives Matter and, and uh, the spotlight that's been shown on, uh, shined rather, upon these high profile uh, shootings. But he was a, uh, someone I would consider a mentor, someone I could, would consider uh, who I looked uh, up to. Uh, I still read his books uh, that I have on my bookshelf, autographed by him. Um, and it gives me inspiration and I, uh, I was blessed to have known him uh, for the time that uh, my life and his uh, life uh, intersected on this earth. Who are some of the uh, people, organizations, groups uh, who have, who support uh, the defense fund? You alluded to uh, some of them yesterday yeah. when uh, we filmed uh, Ms. Edelman. So, so we're excited that uh, we work in coalitions, we work uh, with a lot of organizations across the state. We're proud yesterday that Angela Glover Blackwell, the founder, president of PolicyLink, is the co-chair of the Children's Defense Fund board. Um, there are others uh, in uh, California from LaFonza Butler who uh, is uh, the leader of SCIU 2015, now renamed SCIU 2015, uh, a huge labor leader who's on uh, the CDF board, uh, Carol Biondi and Katie McGrath and Ruth Huvain and uh, Journey Smollett and Reese Witherspoon round out the California folks who are on the national board. But you also have people like Brian Stevenson. And uh, we think about organizations such as the California Endowment and the California Wellness Foundation and uh, Sierra Health Foundation and Weingart and others uh, who supported us uh, tremendously, California Community Foundation. Uh, we are fortunate, and, and some of the organizations that we partner with, from Children Now to Children's Partnership, through our health work, the Youth Justice Coalition, Ella Baker Center, uh, on uh, juvenile justice work, um, we're fortunate to have a broad range of allies and of stakeholders, people, organizations, individuals who are committed to justice, who are committed uh, to ensuring that justice for children and equity for children is pursued at all costs and people who are interested in causing a ruckus uh, in the lives, uh, uh, for the lives rather, uh, of children and of shaking up the status quo. Um, and that's ultimately what uh, has to happen if you want to get things uh, done. And our, our legislative partners who uh, we work with across the space, excited uh, about uh, what's happening uh, in the state, excited what's happening in our counties uh, with our uh, county partners and 
uh, across uh, this space. So uh, we are happy to work with uh, anyone and everyone who uh, is fixated and focused on improving outcomes for children, young people, and families. And, and that's really bottom line. So if uh, there are individuals out there who uh, uh, want to get more involved in the Children's Defense Fund, I encourage you to uh, encourage them uh, to go to our website, www.cdfca.org. Uh, follow us on Twitter at CDFCA. Uh, we're on Facebook, Children's Defense Fund California, on Instagram at CDFCA. So uh, there's no way that you could escape uh, social media uh, presence, sign up for our email list. Uh, and we'd be happy uh, to figure out where there's a will, there's a way uh, to get more involved in this movement uh, to change the lives uh, and change the narratives uh, for children and ultimately uh, improve their outcomes. As we wrap, uh, I want to say I almost didn't get this interview because it was just a matter of hours. Yeah. So I'm really, really happy to have gotten it. And um, you have the last word. Uh, well, well, again, uh, let me thank uh, uh, you for uh, uh, hunting me down and uh, uh, getting me uh, happy to be up in the Bay Area. Uh, really to talk about the importance of uh, protecting and investing uh, and building our future, uh, building a stronger future uh, for children. Uh, and so my last word is simply that we ought to, uh, in 2016, uh, be causing a ruckus for children, uh, shaking up the status quo, renewing our commitment uh, to improve lives uh, for children. Uh, and if we don't uh, do that, then uh, I don't know what we are doing. And if not us, uh, then who? If not now, uh, then when? Uh, we must uh, refocus uh, ourselves on the pursuit of justice, a pursuit of equity, the pursuit of equality uh, for children and making certain uh, that their lives are improved uh, not just for this generation, but for generations to come. Uh, so I'm just so happy to be up uh, in the Bay Area, in uh, San Francisco, in Oakland yesterday, uh, causing a ruckus uh, for children. And I want to thank uh, you all. I hope that you uh, will become involved in the Children's Defense Fund California. Thank you so much.